Black Girls Podcast, a weekly conversation about mental health, personal development, and all the small decisions we can make to become the best possible versions of ourselves. I'm your host, Dr. Joy Harden Bradford, a licensed psychologist in Atlanta, Georgia. For more information or to find a therapist in your area, visit our website at therapyforblackgirls.com. While I hope you love listening to and learning from the podcast, it is not meant to be a substitute for a relationship with a licensed mental health professional. Hey, y'all. Thanks so much for joining me for this special bonus episode of the Therapy for Black Girls podcast. This time, I'm joined by the other members of our production team to dig into our thoughts about the ending of Insecure and what it has meant to us as a podcast. We'll get into the conversation right after a few words from our sponsors. Like many of you, the members of our production team were front and center every Sunday night to catch the new episodes of Insecure because we were fans of the show. But watching Insecure also became a large part of our production process as a team. We have a group chat where we share our reactions to the episodes. We discuss which episodes we would recap and what topics we wanted to delve deeper into. So not only are we saying goodbye to the show, we're also saying goodbye to that piece of our work together. So we wanted to share our thoughts about what this has meant to our work, our thoughts on the finale, and some thoughts on the documentary that was released to accompany the finale detailing more of the behind the scenes action. Here's our conversation. Introduce the production teams. Many of you have heard Cindy on the podcast because we did an episode recapping like the highlights, but we have new team members that you may not have been introduced to. So if everyone would share who they are, where you're located and your role here on the team, that'd be great. Hey everyone. My name is Elise Ellis. I am the assistant podcast producer and I'm in DC. Hey everyone. I'm Frida Lucas. I'm the senior producer here for the Therapy for Black Girls podcast. And I'm also located in DC and originally from the Yay area. Hey everyone. Back again, Cindy Okereke, one of the producers here for Therapy for Black Girls. Yeah. So I think it has been really incredible for a show like Harold and Helmed by a Black woman to also have a team of Black women like working on the podcast. So of course, this is what we do every week. But I think that there has been something very special about the Insecure episodes because we are watching it just as a group of Black women, but also thinking about, okay, what kind of content are we going to create for the community related to the episodes? So it's just been a really cool thing, I think, for the team to do. And it feels like a little bit of a team bonding exercise as well. Yeah, I've for sure feel that because in so many ways it like reflect the different viewpoints that we're approaching it from and like the different places in life and so I think that just adds to the richness of the conversation when we're building out these episodes because there's like a thought or a small detail that one of us will capture or think about that can turn into so much more and so I think that's also what's so fun about Insecure is they really do cram a lot into these like short episodes when you go back and watch them over and over again. So that's been just a really great experience. When I began in November of this year, I'm pretty sure the first podcast episode we worked on all together as a team was one of our insecure episodes. And I can't think of a better way to be introduced to working on a podcast to support Black women and the development and growth of Black women than by working on a podcast episode specifically about a show that has really assisted me in developing as a Black woman. And it's just been so fun, y'all. I think Insecure started five years ago. Something that I've like been on Twitter talking about for five years, getting to like actually work on it in a professional capacity or work on something related to it is really fun. And it's interesting because we think that TV isn't important, can be seen as frivolous, but a lot of important life moments are reflected on the TV show. So to have that talked about in a mental health context with two professionals and being able to work on that, I think it's really important. Sometimes 
we don't know how to process things that we see in entertainment. And so I'm glad that I got to work on a show that kind of helped people process what went on on Insecure. Mm -hmm. Very good points from all of you. So as fans of the show, tell me how you are feeling less than 24 hours post series finale. Did all of your hopes and dreams come true? What were your thoughts on the finale? This is a hard one, to be honest, just because for me, I don't think I expected expected anything except I just want everyone to be where they want to be. That's kind of been my whole approach to like season five, which I know in some places was slow for people or like, they're like, I just don't understand what this episode has to do with. But for me, I was like, I think it's kind of like boring, quote unquote, because we're watching a bunch of people who've kind of learned how to process through drama. And at least for me, I found as I've gotten older, there's a lot less drama in like your friend groups. Like, I think that's just through maturing through like people going to therapy and like figuring out where they can be better and communicate better and offer a little bit better. So it was kind of, for me, fun to kind of watch that process through. And I just think that it's wild how much they crammed into the last episode. but it it had this like weird pacing that felt the same way that like time moves. So I just thought that was cool. I really love what you said, Cindy, about things being less messy and there being less drama. What I enjoyed about the season finale and the show as a whole is it represents what can happen when you decide that you're not going to be an all or nothing person. You're more so going to be someone who really evaluates what's going to make you the happiest. And when you communicate that clearly with other people and consistently, they're generally pretty joyous for you. I really enjoyed that Nathan came to Issa's birthday party. There's no beef there. I really enjoyed that Lawrence was still open to picking up her phone call. I really enjoy the idea that what if no one truly is rooting against you? What if actually everyone is really wanting you to succeed and prevail and be prosperous and be happy as opposed to what sometimes I think in my own head, which is, oh, they're already mad at me or they don't want to hear from me or what instead if everything really was going to be okay. And I think the season finale was very comforting for me in that affirmation for my life that, oh, actually, maybe everything could actually really be okay and that my life is more of a fairy tale than you know, a, a drama series. It might actually be something really spectacularly wonderful. I like what Frida said, what if everything is going to be okay? I think some of the biggest shift I saw from season one to now with both Molly and Issa was some of the apprehension they had when going after what they wanted. They were both super overthinkers when it came to dating, especially for Molly, but Issa with career stuff, they were asking a lot of questions. I think in the last two episodes, especially the one with the dream escape episode, we saw Issa just kind of weighing career decisions, but it was nice to see like, okay, so she went after doing the blow CC, the block, and it worked out for her. And that was really great to see. Yeah, she had fears and hesitations, but I don't think she was always second guessing herself. She was affirming herself a lot more. And the same with Molly, to see her get married in the end and to see her be with Torian. I think a lot of the men she dated before, she had a lot of questions about them and never like spoke up about it. Or she would do like weird things to try to maneuver the relationship. But it was nice to see, okay, these things worked out for both of them because they kind of went after it a little more aggressively. And so I was really just proud of both of them for their growth in the end. And it was definitely bittersweet because I have questions like, how did Issa really end up with Lawrence and X, Y, Z? But I think they were able to put a nice bow on the episode without leaving too many questions. So I was happy about that. Ooh, you bring up a good point, Elise. So what would you have liked to see in the finale or maybe in this final season that we didn't see? So the first thing that like stood out to me was obviously no one wanted Molly's mom to die, but I wanted to see how like that would have played out Mm. a little longer, maybe across like an episode or two, or even if it happened in the last episode and then we might have saw like a funeral I think how people deal with death, especially as an adult, like especially when your parent dies and how that affects your entire community, I think it would have been really 
impactful to see that. And then I had a big question mark. Where was Condola? Like, I don't know. I just felt like we needed to see her one more time Mm. because she was just such a big part of Issa and Lawrence's story and also Issa's story from when she did her first event. So kind of seeing like, where's their relationship now? And then I had a lot of questions on, is Tiffany okay? Mm. Like she obviously didn't like Colorado. And so I was definitely left with a few question marks about that. I agree with a lot of those. Just in thinking about like my own experiences with when a friend loses their parent, I think seeing what that grieving process looks like and how it is unique in the ways that you as a friend approach that or as the person who has lost their parent, like how are you processing and like what are you requesting and what do you need? I feel like it's something that we'll all eventually potentially experience. And and I think like seeing what that process looks like would have been really just like interesting to explore because so central to this has been the ways that they show up for each other, like Issa and Molly and and us seeing these celebratory moments. Like I also kind of wish we also got to see that in some of their other points of friction or loss. And I feel like Tiffany's like story could have been more developed, but like when we think about the fact that like Issa and Molly are really like the core soulmate relationship that we've just been following, like I kind of understand us not exploring that as much because when I think about it, I don't think Tiffany and Issa are ultimately that close as like we kind of see over the seasons, even with the comments that she made in her going away party, you're just like, okay, (laughs) like she loves Issa, but she just kind of still has like a little bit of awkwardness with her. And I think like that vulnerability isn't always like fully explored between the two of them. So I think That could have been another interesting moment to like add is I think it was the car scene after Coachella between Tiffany and Issa, where you saw a new kind of like intimacy between the two of them. I think we could have seen something like that in the finale. So for me, nothing was missing from the finale. But the one thing that I need from the Insecure universe is a style guide on every outfit from the season finale. Every single one. I oh, the that. outfits were so good. I specifically want the outfit that Issa wore to her surprise birthday party. <laughs> so you have an outfit <laughs> and an occasion in mind, it sounds like, Frida, where you're ready to wear the outfit. <laughs> One, 1,000%, absolutely. <laughs> oh, so I think for me, what I would have loved to see, not necessarily in this season finale, but this entire season, I would have really loved to see more about how Issa and Molly found their way back to one another. So I think we saw in the season opener that, you know, it still felt a little awkward for them, but they were trying to like work on rebuilding their friendship. And we just never saw a lot of that. And I know they have to make tough choices about what to include and what moves the story forward. But selfishly, that is what I was most interested in. So that's what I would have loved to see more of this season. More from our conversation after the break. This segment is sponsored by Novo Nordisk. It's easy to get down on ourselves about our weight. That's because we tend to see weight regain or lack of weight loss as a personal failing. But it's important to take a step back and look at what is happening culturally around us. For instance, the pandemic. For the past year and some change, there have been so many new things to navigate. The kids have been home doing virtual school. Your dining room has become your office. And the things that you used to turn to for relaxation, like massages and working out at the gym, have largely been taken away. With so many changes and the anxiety of the pandemic, it's really easy to do things like snack because you're bored or stressed, chips are my go-to, or opt to watch your favorite show instead of going out for a walk. I'm sure you can relate to that. But the bottom line is, a lot of us struggled with taking care of ourselves because there was so much happening. And naturally, it led to weight gain and weight regain. Struggles related to a lack of access to healthy food make it more challenging to lose weight and maintain weight loss. When it's easier to get processed foods than fruits and vegetables, of course this will impact how you eat and ultimately your weight. But there's also a science behind weight loss and weight regain. When we lose weight, changes in our body's appetite hormones can make us feel hungrier. This causes us to eat more and regain the weight we lost. 
and it also makes weight management that much more difficult. So it's easy to feel stuck in a cycle of weight loss and regain. A great resource to learn more about this is truthaboutweight.com. In fact, people living with excess weight generally make seven serious attempts to lose weight over time. Seven. And while diet and exercise are our familiar go-tos and are important, they don't have to be and aren't the only parts of your weight loss plan. Weight management is much more complex than what we eat and how we move. It's physiology too. Probably more that than anything else. That's why it's important to partner with a healthcare provider to create a weight management plan that works for you. It should be someone you trust and someone you feel comfortable talking with. Because you shouldn't ever feel embarrassed about excess weight or let anyone else make you feel less than. To learn more about how to have that conversation with a doctor or nurse, visit truthaboutweight.com. That's truthaboutweight.com. Once you find a healthcare provider you feel comfortable with, you can work together to develop a weight management plan that is right for you. I have a question for the group. So how do you process when life feels like it is a montage? When you're like, wow, where has the time been? Where has my life gone? I I say that because of the series of birthdays and celebrations we saw in the final Mm -hmm. episode. It was a strong reminder that, wow, life is actually moving very fast. And how do I live in my life and be present, but also be aware of the fact that it is flying by me? I'm going to be honest. I don't know how to process it. For me, I was like, sometimes that is how you like chart time. And sometimes you are just going and doing. And then next thing you know, it's like, oh, shit, it's this person's birthday. And so in a lot of ways, I'm like, oh, yeah, this is why people journal. So that you can like really go back and revisit those like gaps in time, like from all the doing and, and like really get to see that in front of you. So I think that's potentially one way to figure out a system for yourself to mark time and reflect. But yeah, like it really does move to celebration, which is like sometimes the thing that's really beautiful about life in between those things. Like I would assume that there are like small intimate moments that we're not getting Because sometimes it is the highlight reel. I think that that's something that's been really difficult, especially in the pandemic. And I know we've heard people talk about like how time feels so warped. Mm -hmm. It feels really hard to like mark time anymore. And like, especially right now when people are sharing this thing that happened in January of 2021 and you're like, that was this year. Right. And so, you know, I think that's something to pay attention to, especially in the pandemic when so much feels like, not anchored to any point in time. And so like to Cindy's point, I think journaling can be a great way to help you to stay more focused on the present moment. I mean, again, journaling doesn't have to be, you know, as we talked about in the episode a couple of weeks ago, this like grand exercise, right? It can really just be a daily accounting of what happened and what are you reflecting on for the day that can really help you to stay more present focused. Yeah. And this is like kind of random, but I will always sometimes route us to astrology because Here we are. (laughs) But (laughs) but I also find it really interesting that like the show itself is such a great representation of your Saturn return. Because like I think back to the first episode, we were celebrating Issa's 29th birthday, which I think it's like 27 to like 29 and a half or so is usually like your Saturn return. And it's like often filled with so many changes. And sometimes things like move really fast. And like sometimes things are like moving really slow, but ultimately it's a test of how you essentially want to set yourself up to be as an adult. Like the finale for me felt really gratifying in the sense that those couple years or so of when everything is kind of like in flux, you're not sure anymore. Is this leap of faith going to work? Is this hard pivot going to work? And then everything does fall into the place that it needs to be. And you get to step into this more assured place, which I think is like really cool. I think that's also in some ways is why I think so many people resonate with it too. Because I think for when it started, so many of us were approaching that time period or just having finished it and seeing all the different ways that in the regularness of it, you're like, oh, yeah, that was significant. Or like, oh, yeah, like, if I were in that situation, I would do this differently, potentially. And so I just wanted to kind of call that out, because 
like girlfriends also started similarly, like Joan's 29th birthday. And you just think about all of the changes that also happened for the women in that series. And I just think that there's something to be said about that time period and like how it ends up resonating so well for a culture and for folks when they go back and watch it. I think the other thing that would be interesting to kind of think about is, did you have a favorite episode of the entire show? Not just this season, but of the entire show. I think there are a few episodes that I go back to. So I think it's season two, episode eight. It's Derek's birthday party. Mm. And I think that is an interesting episode because Issa and Lawrence have this fight at the end. And it's just a lot. Like it's messy. It's kind of funny. But it shows you all the stuff that they never actually talked about in their relationship that frustrated them with each other. And so I think that episode is really good to look at if you want to think about the growth in their relationship or how they almost didn't grow. But even when Issa kind of broke up with Lawrence, I felt like the conversation was just very short. And I think that conversation that they had in season two or that argument, it was exciting to see because it's like, okay, you guys are finally really talking to each other instead of tiptoeing around your feelings. And so I always think about that. And then of course the Coachella episode was great. Any episode where there was a party. So like Coachella, Kiss and Grind, that was also in season two. I really enjoyed those episodes. I think they were shot beautifully. And then there's the episode where Issa and Lawrence, they go on a date and they go like, go to some restaurant. She sees like the TSA guy that she was messing with. And it's just shot really beautiful, but I think it's another episode where we see Issa and Lawrence have like a quote unquote real conversation, which I think they really didn't have a lot of times over the show. But when they did, it was like very impactful to their relationship and moved it forward. So I enjoyed those. Mm -hmm. Those are good choices. Anybody else have different ones? I wouldn't say this is a favorite episode, but I just very strongly remember hearing Issa say out loud to someone oh, I don't really fuck with Molly like that anymore. Mm. And now in the most recent season finale, see Issa assist Molly with taking off her wedding dress. It makes me very emotional because to me, my favorite storyline has continued to be their friendship. And I think watching the season finale, I'll have to add the season finale as one of my favorite episodes in the series because it has instilled in me, I would really like to be able to go through the rest of my life without losing such a close friend. And I think I now understand the gravity of the beautifulness that you can lose out on by not choosing to work on your friendships as much as you may work on your romantic partnerships. That's a beautiful takeaway. I love that. I love that so much. Yeah, I'm having a hard time picking a favorite episode and like similarly to what Frida was saying it's really for me like the girl friendships that have really kept me here when I think about it because at least for me personally like those are often like my most important relationships and yes I have romantic partners and all of that but when I really really sit down and think about it sisterhood has been a central and like deep focus for me personally. And honestly, like that whole dress scene, I was in shambles. Because, you know, episode one, they weren't the nicest friends to each other. Mm -hmm. When I just think about Broken Pussy, and I love that for a circle moment, because I was like, the redemption needed to happen. (laughs) (laughs) But like, to know that you can go from a place like, yeah, I don't fuck with that person anymore, and then come back, like, I just think that's really beautiful. I think Coachella was one of the episodes that stood out for me. But like, I really do love all the episodes for like their own unique thing. And I'm the worst person for that because I'm never able to choose in that way because I have just an appreciation for like the uniqueness of everything. So yeah, I think Elise picks my list as well. So I also really love the Coachella episode and the low-key happy episode where we saw her and Lawrence on that date last season and, you know, trying to flirt with the idea of whether they were going to try to find their way back to one another. I also think the waiting to exhale is what I call it 
episode from this season yes. became a favorite because it just felt like just those like very regular but so meaningful nights you have with your girls and you just kick back at somebody's house and like singing songs and being silly. I just really appreciated seeing that. Yeah. Those are always my my like go to ones when they're all together. Mm -hmm. Just being friends. More from our conversation after the break. This segment is sponsored by Novo Nordisk. It's easy to get down on ourselves about our weight. That's because we tend to see weight regain or lack of weight loss as a personal failing. But it's important to take a step back and look at what is happening culturally around us. For instance, the pandemic. For the past year and some change, there have been so many new things to navigate. The kids have been home doing virtual school. Your dining room has become your office. And the things that you used to turn to for relaxation, like massages and working out at the gym, have largely been taken away. With so many changes and the anxiety of the pandemic, it's really easy to do things like snack because you're bored or stressed. Chips are my go-to. Or opt to watch your favorite show instead of going out for a walk. I'm sure you can relate to that. But the bottom line is, a lot of us struggle with taking care of ourselves because there was so much happening. And naturally, it led to weight gain and weight regain. Struggles related to a lack of access to healthy food make it more challenging to lose weight and maintain weight loss. When it's easier to get processed foods than fruits and vegetables, of course this will impact how you eat and ultimately your weight. But there's also a science behind weight loss and weight regain. When we lose weight, changes in our body's appetite hormones can make us feel hungrier. This causes us to eat more and regain the weight we lost. And it also makes weight management that much more difficult. So it's easy to feel stuck in a cycle of weight loss and regain. In fact, people living with excess weight generally make seven serious attempts to lose weight over time. Seven. And while diet and exercise are our familiar go-tos and are important, they aren't the only parts of your weight loss plan. Weight management is much more complex than what we eat and how we move. It's physiology too, probably more than anything else. That's why it's important to partner with a healthcare provider to create a weight management plan that works for you. It should be someone you trust and someone you feel comfortable talking with because you shouldn't ever feel embarrassed about excess weight or let anyone else make you feel less than. Once you find a healthcare provider you feel comfortable with, you can work together to develop a weight management plan that is right for you. So in addition to the finale, we also got a beautiful documentary directed by James Bland that captured lots of behind the scenes action of this final season. What were your thoughts on that? For me as like a behind the scenes person, I love the documentary and like I just think that it really gelled together certain things. This is also just like a random like moment that I just picked out and like thinking back to Molly's wedding in particular and that song that was playing feels good. And it reminded me of Love and Basketball. I'm pretty sure it's the ending song when like Quincy's on the sideline with Monica's kid and everything. And they're just like, they're getting played out or whatever. And so that playing while like Issa and Lawrence were like together in frame also for me was like, I know a lot of people are kind of like, oh, why would they like get back together like that? that love and basketball kind of like moment. Cause I mean, in some ways when you think back on it, Quincy wasn't the greatest, <laughs> but I love that movie. And hearing that that was one of the movies that really inspired Issa to go into film in the first place was really cool. So like those homages to those that came before her in black Hollywood is like just really cool to see. And so I feel like for the documentary, like you got to see a lot of that too, from the fact that their writer's room, like everyone's going on to do all these like really cool and amazing things and like the deep mentorship and like opportunities it's created for black folks. And when I just think about, it's like kind of filling that gap that like when UPN and the WB merged and created the CW mm -hmm. and we lost a lot of those shows. And like when you go back and look at some of those credits and seeing like Prentice has some credits for girlfriends and to know the impact of the way that Mara would build her writer's rooms and create her shows is kind of having this like next generation ripple effect is also just really cool. And just want to just shout out Vicky Thomas 
She's the casting director. And honestly, I feel like she clearly kills it because every single time we look at the screen, we're just like, who is that? They're so talented, fine, amazing. And it's just, yeah, like you don't get to see that a lot when you think about like casting, especially taking the chance on like the unknown. And so, yeah, there are just like so many behind the scenes moments and creators and artists that I just feel like this has created a new lane for. Yeah, I definitely appreciated seeing the documentary too because it did bring like all of these like loose ends, I think, from the behind the scenes part together. But I appreciated that the team would be live tweeting so often, right? You know, because I think Mm -hmm. for a lot of shows, you don't get that like behind the scenes input about like why they shot a scene the way they did or what was the intention of making this choice versus something else. And so I think that that also let people into the world in a way that we don't see a lot of other shows do. So I think, you know, the documentary, but also their presence on Twitter and on socials was really impactful in some ways just for the behind the scenes stuff. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Decisions are made. And I think it's like also cool how much they support each other and come together, standing behind the decisions or sharing kind of like the insights that were like, why would you do that? And they're like, here are all the reasons why. (laughs) (laughs) And you're like, okay, fine. You made some points. (laughs) But it's definitely going to be missed and like a huge absence when I think about like, what am I supposed to do with myself on Sunday? I know we need something else now. Just to touch on what Cindy said, I do like how a lot of people behind the scenes of the show were open about the process. And like she said, why they shot different things. I go back and forth personally. Is that annoying? Do I want the work to speak for itself? But I do think For like modern television, a lot of the stuff we saw in Insecure was just unprecedented, even if you talk about like the designers that they use in the show. Mm -hmm. And so I'm glad to see like, okay, we wanted to support XYZ designer. And Frida said earlier, she wants every look that was in the series finale. And I know we're probably going to get something like that, but I just loved hearing about like the music and how artists would like tweet like, oh, I'm insecure tonight. I always thought that was so fun. And of course, every show, like all the details are important, but I think Insecure wanted to be not just a big TV moment, but a big like cultural moment. I think you could see that across the board through the music and the fashion. So I'm glad that a lot of people behind the scenes are so passionate about the show that they worked on because I think it made the experience better for me as a viewer. Yeah, and I think that's something else they shared in the documentary, just the longevity of the writer's room. They had been together for some time. I think the first three seasons of writers were the same and then they got new people and they were with them for the final two, you know, so it feels like there was just a lot of like cohesiveness amongst the team, which I think we then ended up seeing on the screen. Yeah, and that's huge. And also pretty rare. As you can tell, we're going to miss Insecure both as a show and also as a touch point for our team. We already have our eyes open for the next shows we'll be able to dig into. And I have spent a lot of time over this break watching a lot of good stuff. If you're looking for some new things to add to your watch list, might I suggest Harlem and With Love from Amazon Prime, Love Life, especially season two, and Southside on HBO Max, and Selling Tampa, Emily in Paris, and How to Ruin Christmas on Netflix. What are you watching? Are there things you've loved recently that I should add to my list? Are shows you'd love to hear us discuss here on the podcast? Send those to us at therapyforblackgirls.com slash mailbox or share them with us on social media using the hashtag TBG in session. If you're looking for a therapist in your area, be sure to check out our therapist directory at therapyforblackgirls.com slash directory. And if you want to continue digging into this topic or just be in community with other sisters, come on over and join us in the sister circle. It's our cozy corner of the internet designed just for black women. You can join us at community.therapyforblackgirls.com. Thank y'all so much for joining me for this bonus episode. I look forward to continuing these conversations with you all real soon. Take good care. Take good care.